Thank you, uh, Crystal, for that. Our Father is a chain breaker, and we're often bound by chains and don't even know it. Um, in a minute, we're going to be in the Gospel of John. We've been studying the life of Jesus, the teachings, the ministry, the miracles, the life of Jesus. Today, we're going to look at an incident, a story. Crystal told a little bit about that. Um, the story of Nicodemus when he comes to Jesus. We're going to read that in a minute, which is John chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. But uh, to start out, we're talking about birth. We're talking about being born. And as I was preparing my message this week, I couldn't help but uh, think back to when I started my practice in obstetrics. It was the first thing I did when I got out of residencies. I delivered a lot of babies for a long time. And I remember... When I first started that, that OB practice, I would every so often, every couple of weeks, get a patient who would come in and say, Doctor, I want to have a natural birth. I want to have a natural birth. And that confused me at first. It puzzled me because I honestly, and I'll tell you why in a minute, but I honestly thought, well, aren't all births natural? I mean, you want to have a supernatural birth or do you want to have an unnatural birth? You, you, why would you, I mean, what other kind of birth is there? It's natural. It's a natural process. The reason I was confused, I soon came to realize that what they were saying was, I want to have no medical intervention. I don't want to have an epidural for pain. I don't want to have you use forceps or vacuum extractor. I don't want you to do a C-section. I just want you to basically let the baby fall out and stay out of the way. That's what they really meant by a natural birth. Why was that confusing to me? Because when I did my residency and my internship, I worked in the inner city. And I never had anybody ask for a natural birth in that setting. In fact, it was quite the opposite. They wanted the most unnatural birth. They would say, can I have my epidural before I come to the hospital? Because I don't want to feel any labor pains whatsoever. So that's what I was used to. When I went to my private practice, I began to have patients who were very interested in natural birth and experiencing a natural birth. Well, we're going to be talking about the birth process today, which is ironic with some of, of my history, because I've delivered a lot of babies. But we're talking about a different kind of birth altogether. You know? But when we think about birth, we think about a natural, physical process. Josie just had her birthday. She turned five, and so she's begun to ask some questions about where did I come from? How was I born? Did you know? How was I brought into this world? How was I born? Reminds me of the story of the little girl who was tasked in, I think it was second or third grade, with writing an essay on the birthing process. Where do babies come from? What happens with the birth? And so she went home and began to do some research, and she asked her, uh, her mother, where did I come from? And the mother said, well, honey, you were brought by the, the stork. The baby stork brought you, and you've heard that story. The stork brought you and left you on the front porch. So she's writing that down. She asked her dad the same thing. He tells her the same story. She says, well, where were you born? He said, well, the stork delivered me to, to grandma and grandpa's. So she decides to dig further and ask her aunt and uncles where they were born, how they were born. And they told her the same story. The stork brought us and delivered us to the house. So the little girl writes a report, goes to school, stands up and says, well, apparently in my family we haven't had a natural birth for three generations. <laughs> it's all been about the stork. The point is, when we think about birth, we think about a natural process, and Jesus spoke about this thing called the new birth, or this born-again process, that we really often don't understand what he was really talking about today. I hope we can dig into what he was talking about. Let's read in the book of John, chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 16. It said, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him and said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, he cannot be a child of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? 
Jesus answered, Assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. And so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. There's some mystery there. Nicodemus answered back to him and said, How can these things be? Jesus said, Are you a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Assuredly, I say to you, we speak that we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And the famous verse, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, Jesus liked to speak in metaphors. Uh, he wanted to engage our minds and illustrate things for us. And he does so here. He says things like, I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread of life. I'm the vine and you're the branches. He says, I'm the living water. And in this story, he gives us probably the most famous and the most poorly understood illustration of, of all time. That of being born again. Or being born a second time. Being reborn. It's most problematic and understood for many reasons. Let me give you an example. If you say to your neighbor, who's an agnostic or an atheist, if you're talking to them and they don't believe in God, and you say, I go to the church of the light, you'd probably say, well, that's better than dark, okay. Or you say, I go to the church of the vine, or the, living, the living water, okay. But if you say, I go to the church of the born again, he'll probably say, okay, I'll see you later. They don't understand what that means, and most people have a wrong understanding of what it means to be born again. So I want to answer three questions about this issue of being born again. Number one, what is the importance of it? Why is it important? What's the significance? Number two, what is it? What does it really mean to be born again? And number three, how do we get it? Importance, what is it, how do we get it? Nicodemus, we're going to see, contradicts every single paradigm or every single assumption that we make about being born again. He contradicts all of them. And that's why I think this is such an important story that happened in the life of Jesus. There was a survey done not long ago that said 70% of average Americans would prefer not to live next door to a born-again Christian. Why? And I think it's because the average American, whether they have maybe some loose connection with Christianity or loose religious connection, maybe in family or in name, or have no connection to church or God whatsoever, I think the problem is the average American believes that the born-again experience, this thing we call being born again, is a deep, cathartic, life-changing experience that is needed for certain kinds of people. And just certain kinds of people. If we were to ask who, they would probably say prostitutes or alcoholics or maybe heroin addicts or ex-cons or criminals. And sure, they'll say, absolutely, if these people can be born again and can get some kind of new turn on life, then the power be with them. So be it. But I, I don't really need that. I can understand how these people... These people need a, a deep emotional rearrangement in their life such that they would act differently, like Crystal was talking about, have different priorities, be different. Those people need that. Or they might say, they might say, okay, it's for, being born again is for maybe weak people who need a moral structure. You know, they've had problems with, with uh, keeping, I mean, they have loose morals and they've gotten into trouble they need some kind of cathartic, born-again, emotional experience like that to get on the right track. But I don't think I really need that. But maybe for people who need morals, or maybe for people who are just deeply lost. 
Well, interesting thing is, that's not what Jesus was talking about at all. And that's the interesting thing about this story. He wasn't really talking about alcoholics and drug addicts and criminals and lost people and people who have no purpose in life or no moral structure. He was talking to Nicodemus. And let me remind you who Nicodemus was. Nicodemus was an aristocrat. We know from other sources, Jewish sources as well as the Bible, outside secular sources, that Nicodemus was a, a rich, at the top of the economic structure, a teacher among teachers, a man who followed the law, a man who, who kept the Jewish law perfectly, as much as he could. A moral man, right? A member of the priestly class. And so you look at this and you say, well, he's talking to a man here who's basically a moral man, a good man, a teacher, a Jew, uh, a Pharisee of Pharisees, and this is the man that he looks at and says, you, my friend, need to be born again. Interesting. Not an alcoholic, not a weak person, not a person lost, not, not an ex-con, not a criminal, but a moral man that he tells him, you need to be born again. Maybe other people say it's for somebody who just can't find meaning in their life. Okay, so I can't find meaning. I've looked everywhere. Maybe you need a born-again experience. Nicodemus wasn't looking for meaning. If you look at what he came to ask him about, he was actually talking about his teaching, and I think he was trying to find a way to save Jesus, actually, from the Jews. He wasn't looking for meaning. He didn't come seeking emotional help. He didn't come as a conflicted person inside trying to figure out a way to make life work. Or maybe there's one more. They'll say, actually, maybe a born-again experience is good for somebody who needs pat answers, easy answers to life. Because, you know, I've, I can figure things out through my own intellectual prowess and, and, and so forth, and I, I don't really need it. But somebody who might have trouble with that needs the easy answers, the pat answers of Christianity. Once again, Nicodemus was an intellectual among intellectuals if he would have been a Ph.D. if there would have been such a thing to offer in that day. So we can't say the born-again experience is for those who need easy answers, those who need moral structure in their life, those who are ex-cons or people who've gone astray. That can't be what being born again is for or who, who it's for or what it's about. There's a common misconception in the world that if you don't drink, smoke, sleep around, or gamble, and you live a moral life, then you must be one of those born-again types. Well, Nicodemus didn't do any of those things. He, he was one of those guys. He, was, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't sleep around, he didn't gamble. He wasn't one of those people, yet Jesus said, you, my friend, need to be born again. So he wasn't, he hadn't arrived, yet he was a moral good, upright person. Folks, what it means is this, this little story is really a game changer. It's really a paradigm shifter because everything we thought would disqualify us from needing this born again thing, actually we see that Nicodemus, he, he didn't qualify if, if that were what, what, what it was. But in fact, he did qualify. So what Jesus is really saying, and like Crystal said, every person is a caterpillar. Every person needs to be born again. In fact, Jesus really pushed back against the moral structure of the day. And he basically said, yeah, you keep all these rules, but inside your hearts are, are like dirty, rotten tombs, is the word that he used. You're whitewashed on the outside, but on the inside, you're rotten. And that's basically what he's asking us to look at today. Not our outside, but our inside. Well, there's one more thing about it with number one, important. Some people will say, okay, I buy it. It makes sense. I believe Jesus is who he said he was. I mean, C.S. Lewis, Lewis said he's either a liar, a lunatic, or God. Can't be anything else. So he's either a liar, a lunatic, or God. And maybe you say, okay, I believe he was God, but I'm just not ready to do that. That maybe I'll do it when I'm older because I'll be more interested about spiritual things then. And then I think back to when I was working in emergency rooms and the 24-year-old came in with that crush injury that he woke up that day, went to work, 
set to be married in four months. I've told this story before. Is it really impacted me? And there was nothing I could do to help him, nothing a thoracic surgeon could do. He died, 24, had to tell his fiance. He didn't go to work thinking that he was going to die that day. Or the 28-year-old that went over the hill right outside the hospital where I was working in Tennessee, and a truck crossed the line, and he ran head-on into that truck, died instantly, brought right into the outside of the hospital. He wasn't 100 yards away. Nothing we could do. He didn't plan on dying that day. And so I remember when I used to think that way, like, well, maybe later I'll look at this. And then I would see these people die that seemed to be random, and they were young and healthy and nothing wrong with them, gone. We never know when that's going to happen or to whom that's going to happen to. So waiting isn't an option either. So number one, it's important. Jesus basically said you must be born again if you want to be a child of God. Number two, what is it? What is it is Jesus read the heart of Nicodemus. He didn't ask. He didn't come to him and say, what do I need? He came to him and was talking about something else. And Jesus read his heart, said, you need to be, you need to be born. You need to be reborn. You need to have a new birth. Interesting that he used the metaphor of birth. You realize using birth, we can't go back any farther than that. We couldn't go back to our teenage years or our childhood and try to do things different all the way back to when we were born, when we came out, which means it must be a sweeping, profound, deep-seated change in our identity. And it is a new self. We have to repent, walk a different direction, turn, and be born of water and of spirit. It's a purification of the soul. And after being born again, it means we're completely a different human being. doesn't mean we're perfect, but we're walking in a different direction with new priorities, with new motivations, and a new lease on life. That's what he meant by being born again. You will look and act like a new person. They say the old man is gone, the new has come. I give you Exhibit A, Saul of Tarsus. He was murdering Christians, a hateful man with a deep, dark spirit who hated the Christians and wanted to kill them and in fact was killing them. He's riding his donkey to, Tars, to uh, uh, Syria one day, to Damascus, and he gets knocked off the donkey, sees the risen Jesus, is blinded by, for three days, and eventually comes to believe that Jesus Christ is in fact Lord. He turns from being one who kills Christians to the writer of the New Testament. That's a picture of one who's been born again. He began to serve the poor, cherish other people more than himself. His heart was filled with love. His selfish, selfish desires waned. His evil desires went away. Money and power became unimportant to Saul, who became Paul. And he repented and was forgiven. He underwent a salvation experience. That's exhibit A. Exhibit B, St. Augustine. St. Augustine is probably one of the smartest men that has ever lived, I would argue. If you've ever read anything he's ever written, the man lived in about 300 A.D., and he wrote some of the most amazing pieces of, of literature and philosophy that have ever been written. But Augustine lived the first 32 years of his life as a full-blown pagan sinner, he was a womanizer, a partier, everything that you could imagine that you would think wouldn't be a born-again person, that was St. Augustine. St. Augustine um, had a born-again experience. He, he changed. He became a Christian. He turned from a philosopher, an academic uh, philosopher, to being an academic Christian, uh, to becoming a, an intellectual Christian. But when he was living his loose life, he had a penchant for pretty women, and he had been with a lot of women. And then he became a Christian and became a pastor, and he became a different man. He didn't do the things he used to do. He lived a different life with different motivations. Well, St. Augustine, maybe a few months after he had changed, was walking in town. He lived uh, in uh, northern Africa. He was li walk living in this, walking through the city. And one of the girls that he used to visit and frequent walked by him. And uh, he, he wasn't rude, but he just sort of said hello and, and kept walking. And that was different than what he used to do. 
was different. It was a different kind of person and diff didn't seem the same. And so the, the story goes, the girl said, Augustine, it is I. And he looked at her and he said, Yes, but it is not I. It is not I. He'd undergone a change, a game changer, okay? A paradigm change where the world didn't look the same anymore to Augustine. In fact, he's probably, arguably, done, written and done more for the Christian faith than anybody other than Paul. And that's why I use him as an example. At the age of 33. So, we see this radical turning, this radical change in life. It reminds me of the man who says, I have an apple orchard and next year I want to have a grape vineyard. Well, if he was to say to do that, I'm going to buy better fertilizer and I'm going to water more and I'm going to really work hard on this garden I'm going, to, I'm going to take the weeds out. I'm going, to, I'm going to put the right kind of chemicals on these trees. At the end of the day, at the end of the season, he's still going to have an apple orchard. No matter how much better fertilizer he uses, or how much better, more watering he does, or how much more attention he gives to the apples, he's still going to have an apple orchard. He's not going to have a grapevine. He's not going to have, have grapevines in, in an orchard of grapes. I say that he had to plant new roots if he wanted to have grapes. I think there's hardly anything as beautiful as, as the grape vines and the, the, the grape uh, farms out in Napa Valley. I don't think I've ever seen anything more beautiful. But you could never get that from an apple orchard without planting new roots. And basically Peter said that's the same thing we have to do if we want to be born again. We have to pull things out by the root go back and be literally born a second time. He called it the imperishable seed. It's not a changing of a few habits. It's basically a whole new thing, a whole new person. Last week, my laptop was messed up, so I took it in in the UK, and I asked the IT people if they could upgrade it. And they messed around with it, and I'm not much of an IT person, so I, I don't know, but he looked at it and he said, you know what? We got to throw the whole thing out. You have to have a new laptop. So, oh, well, great. You get to pay for it. So that's a good thing. But he couldn't fix the old laptop. And the same thing goes here that we have to have a whole new laptop when it comes to being born again. One scripture that Jesus said was Woe to you, you teachers of the law, people like Nicodemus, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside but on the inside are full of bones and dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Whew. Hard thing to hear. But that's what Jesus says about us, really. It's really the truth. So last, how do I receive it? Well, Jesus is telling Nicodemus, you think that I came here, Nicodemus, to be a teacher, to be a prophet, to be a sage, you know, like Buddha or uh, later Mohammed would come, or like uh, Krishna, you know, these sages, these prophets. He says, you think I came to be another prophet, but I didn't come to teach you, I came to save you. I came to save you. See, nobody had ever done that before. You know, Buddha, Mohammed, and Krishna, they do offer a path to a better life, to some enlightenment, to a better way to live, but none of them can bring salvation. None of those teachers ever did anything to change the status of their followers in the next life, in eternity. None of them ever did anything to do that. Mohammed can't take you to paradise, but Jesus laid down his life for your sins and mine, and if we place our faith in him and repent and ask for his spirit to come into our heart, and we profess that with our mouth and mean it with our heart, he'll come into our soul and we can be born again, born a second time. It's a work of God, not of man. That's why he says the wind blows where it wishes. Because it's a mystery sometimes how this happens. Nicodemus, this man who was an intellectual, top of his game, top of his economic structure, had a real need. He didn't know it. He didn't know it. He thought he was coming for something else. 
that Jesus saw the need in him and he sees the need in you, each of you and in me. He sees the need in us and we, we best not wait till we get older because we never know when we wake up what's going to happen at the end of that day. I've seen that play out too many times, unfortunately, in the lives of, of innocent people who were hit, struck, killed. We never know. But accepting the Lord Jesus and confessing this and meaning it is, is the path to new birth. We can in, indeed be born again. We can be cleaned on the inside and be forgiven of our sins. We can become children of God, children of light. And those born again will be forgiven and develop a relationship with God that's not otherwise possible. And I've come to know that to be the most important thing in my life, regardless of anything else that I've done or anything that I want to do, that is actually at the core of what gives me life and gives me hope. I never was able to find hope any other way than through Jesus Christ. He will change the desires of your heart. The old will go away, the new will come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for this little story. It tells us that being born again is not only important, you said we must be. And, and you said it's not for dropouts and prostitutes. It's for them, but it's for us. It's not just for those who are looking for easy answers. It's, it's, those, it's us. It's me. It's me and everyone here. And, and, and what is it? It's a radical change, and it's something that uh, can't come about from just making a couple of adjustments. We have to radically be born again. It must be a work of God. We can't do it by ourselves. We have to pray for you to do it. We have to humble ourselves and ask you to do it. Father, it's the most important decision we can ever make, and I pray that everybody here hears that message from your spirit, not from me, but from your spirit, that it might tug their heart to know that regardless of what else they do, this is the most important decision they can ever make. How do we do it? We profess with our mouth and mean it in our heart. Father, I pray that we each hear that message today and we think about it this week and let it percolate through our minds and, and change us into the person you want us to be. Bless us as we uh, prepare to go now. And I thank you for this, this worship time, God. pray that you'll work in the hearts of those as we close in a song. In Christ's name, amen. Keith, would you and uh, Paulette come forward?